The world marked International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination this week, and in light of this occasion, we explore the causes, consequences, and countermeasures against racism. So why does racism remain rampant? Where does Korea stand in its awareness about racism and its repercussions? And what are pundits saying about Korea's transition into a multiracial community? Welcome to Issues and Insiders for this Friday. I'm Min Sun here. Today we revisit the issue of racism in our society and the efforts thus far to fight it. For more on this, I have Professor Cho Hee Kyung at Hongik University live on the line. Professor Cho, it's good to have you back. Nice to be there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right. I also have Zelana Zimire, a lecturer at Hanyang University here in Seoul in the studio with us. Nice it's to see pleasure. you. Thank you. Right, Professor Joe, let's begin then with your thoughts on the importance of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The International Day, uh, as UN designates, highlights certain issues. I believe last time I was on this program was actually about uh, International Day for Women for 8th of March. So this is a very useful advocacy tool to highlight light issues surrounding the uh, the particular topic that is the focus of that day and obviously elimination of racism is an important issue for us today particularly because of the increased racism and violent racism around the world uh, post Brexit post COVID and so forth in fact every day should be a day for elimination uh, of racial discrimination but having a day designated to it, I believe, is very useful in terms of educating the public, raising awareness, highlighting the issue and as an advocacy tool. Right, indeed. And before we delve into the efforts then to root out racism, Zelana, perhaps you could tell us a bit about the main reasons mm -hmm. uh, for racism in our society. Hi, so first thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I came here as a scholar a little bit to discuss some findings that I find through my research and also to share experience from some of my friends and also to share best, uh, best practices from other OECD countries. So you mentioned the issue of racism. Uh, I must say that racism and discrimination exist all over the world and Korea is by no means a unique case. What is unique in Korea is that we, luckily, we didn't see some serious uh, cases of abuse. We didn't see hate crimes. We didn't see gang violence. But we did see some serious abuses of 3D workers, for example. And I would say that this is primarily because they are seen as a little bit under sophisticated or even of lower education. And uh, under Confucian values, this is not something that uh, Asian societies really like. However, first, I really need to stress that nobody deserves to be discriminated irrespectively of person's education background. And uh, there are some false prejudices. Uh, for example, not all of them uh, are of lower education. Indeed, some of them have university degree. However, in their countries, because of economic or other reasons, they really had to emigrate and they came here to Korea. And then I have to highlight the issue of hierarchical treatment of foreigners, meaning that people from West, uh, people a little bit of whiter, fair skin, uh, usually enjoy a little bit better treatment than people from developing countries. And the main reason is because people are somehow uh, evaluated based on the developmental status of their country. This is pretty much false because, as you know, we have so many foreign talents uh, in Korea who are from developing countries, but they develop, they contribute to the society in so many brilliant ways. So as a society, I think we have a responsibility to address this issue and to help uh, Korea to thrive. Yeah. Right. And in light of the contributions by our foreign uh, community here in the country, Lana, I understand that mm -hmm. the OECD released a report, I believe, last October, yep. which uh, showed that South Korea is on its way to becoming a multiracial nation this particular year. Uh -huh. Before we delve into that further, what are the prerequisites for this title, a multiracial mm -hmm. nation? 
Yeah, well, I saw the report in question. It says that around 5% of population here in Korea now is of foreign descent. And then this should mean that Korea is multicultural. But Korea indeed became multicultural, but only in terms of quantity, not in terms of quality. Uh, to really become a multicultural society, Korea needs to address the issue of multicultural education. Uh, to give you one plastic example, uh, there are multiracial children and very often they suffer from discrimination and from racism in schools. And schools should provide multicultural education not only to children but to their parents as well. And this should include uh, cross-cultural sensitivity and also peace education. Peace education means conflict resolution and these kind of things. Uh, this can help schools to reduce bullying and to reduce violence. You see, all parents in Korea are interested in this. We all want that our kids grow in safe environment and that they are protected, that they are happy. And one day when they grow up that they can be competitive and competitive in globalized and cross-cultural environment. Then there is an issue of equal pay. Uh, as you know, uh, there is Equal Pay Act in Korea. It is enacted. Uh, however, another OECD report mentioned that there is a 70% gap, uh, gender wage gap in Korea. To test further this premise, I'm collaborating with Sejong University, uh, Tourism Industry Data Analytics Lab. We focus on airline industry and we found out also the gap between what Korean males earn and what Korean females earn is significant. So as you see, um, the uh, law is not enough. Uh, definitely as a society, we need to try to do more to address issues of inequality. And this includes also not only foreigners, but uh, treatment towards Korean women and other underprivileged people as well. Right, of course, yeah. which was something that, as Professor Joe mentioned, we had discussed during International Absolutely. Women's Day. Professor Joe, how do you explain South Korea's relatively quick transition, if I may, into a multiracial nation? Well, I would say mainly two factors, our very low birth rate and the fact that we are a rapidly aging society. Uh, also coupled with that, we have a very highly educated workforce who tend to avoid certain types of work, namely the 3D, uh, the difficulty, uh, difficult, uh, dirty and dangerous jobs. And we've, have, we've had to rely on migrant workers to fill those gaps for many years now. And so, uh, as well as uh, uh, migrant uh, brides that, that we've essentially had to uh, bring in uh, in order to find partners for males living in rural communities who are not very popular as uh, choices uh, of life mates. Uh, there has been a significant increase in the recent years in terms of migrant population. It's actually quite remarkable because compare, comparing our situation to neighboring Japan, which actually has a longer uh, migration history than Korea, they still, the migrant population in, in Japan still remains at around two and a half percent, whereas we are, if we count, count undocumented uh, foreign residents in Korea as well. We are already over 5%, well over the, the OECD uh, definition of multicultural society. Uh, so we're still having to adjust, I think, to our image of this multicultural and multiracial society because for such a long time in our nation's history, we prided ourselves on being a one race nation. And in fact, the reason why we joined this international convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination back in 1978 was that uh, the policymakers back then and the government didn't believe that race or racial discrimination would ever be an issue in Korea because we were a one nation country. And so I think they would have had a hard time believing that we would have already be a, we would have already become such a multiracial country by this stage. Right. And, and that being said then, uh, Zelana, as a multiracial nation here in South mm -hmm. Korea, what are your thoughts regarding the country's awareness, if I may, of the mm -hmm. importance to fight racial discrimination? 
Well, I came to Korea first time in 2008. I earned my master's and PhD degree here and currently I teach so many international students. And I must say that in the last 15 years I saw huge change. Korea really became international and there are so many international people, international students here. Uh, but this is primarily in terms of quantity, as I mentioned, not in terms of quality. Uh, so when I sit down with my students and when we discuss about troubles that they experience in society and some uh, potential solutions, I'm sometimes surprised because uh, even foreign students, they unfortunately have to cope with some silly prejudice. For example, uh, drug use based prejudice, prostitution based prejudice uh, or coronavirus spreading prejudice. This is all a little bit serious uh, prejudice and unfortunately, they are, uh, luckily they are false. And unfortunately, uh, brilliant students, they somehow need to cope with these uh, stereotypes and prejudice, etc. There are some lighter ones, uh, for example, that foreign people don't pay taxes and to cope with this once for all, uh, all foreigners, all um, international population who is working here in Korea, we have to pay taxes, we have to pay health deduction and pension deduction. Uh, so at the end of the day, like what I'm trying to say is that we as society need to cope with this kind of false prejudice if we want to have truly multicultural, like thriving society. Um, also, I think foreigners need to be given a chance to speak with their own voice uh, by themselves, not only by Korean activists. Their um, efforts have been remarkable. However, foreigners, as I say, they, they know the best what are their experience. And that's why it's very important that they are able to speak by themselves. Uh, I would like to provide one suggestion to universities and to NGOs. Uh, and that is not just talk about racism and discrimination, uh, but um, also to try to promote the value of international working force. Uh, what we see from other OECD countries uh, is that innovation and development happen as a result of knowledge transfer from international population toward locals. And I sincerely hope seeing this more in future in Korea. Right, and so do I. Thank Meanwhile, you. Professor Joe, uh, our uh, Zelana, our Dr. Zimiri, of course, she yep. talked about how uh, laborers, foreign laborers, that is, mm -hmm. the ones who face 3D jobs, they face a difficult, a more difficult time here compared to their other counterparts. What can you share with us about the working environment of foreign laborers here in South Korea? You know, um, the international NGO Amnesty International released a report entitled. Uh, migrant workers are human beings too, back in 2006, two years after the employment permit system was adopted by the Korean government that actually legalized issuing visas for uh, foreign workers coming to Korea. But if you simply, you know, swapped the date from 2006 to, to the 2024, you would still have exactly the same problems that were pointed out in that report existing today. Migrant workers are subject to serious and systemic abuses. Now, we're talking about those migrant workers who are coming to Korea uh, to be engaged in very simple and manual labor, and not the uh, elite, highly educated workers, mostly from rich Western countries that Dr. Zemir also referred to, uh, these uh, migrant workers are limited to certain types of industries where the government has uh, granted issuing of uh, working permits to employers. And they are also restricted to that particular workplace, which is in their visa condition. So from the moment that they actually leave their country of origin uh, as to when they enter uh, Korea, uh, to while they're staying in the country, uh, working and even departing uh, Korea, they are subject to all sorts of exploitation and discrimination and very often abuses. So many of them are underpaid uh, in terms of hours not actually being fully counted. So for example, um, most of the food that we actually you know, eat every day, the vegetables on our tables, uh, would not be there without the, the presence of migrant workers. And yet these uh, mostly women laborers uh, from Cambodia work some tw 10, 12 hours per day, every day without any break 
uh, not even toilet break, and yet they only get paid about eight hours of work. Uh, they pick something like 15,000 uh, sesame leaves uh, each day, and they are often housed in very inadequate accommodation, such as temporary a vinyl, you know, covered greenhouse type housing that are, you know, boiling in summer, freezing in winter. Uh, often because they are women, they're subject to more types of exploitation and abuse, such as sexual abuse and harassment from employers. But because of this EPS system, it means that even if they are not paid wages properly and they are subject to abuse, unless they can actually prove this, they're unable to leave their workplace. And so this EPS system, which was actually introduced to protect migrant workers in the initial stages, is actually being used as almost like a ser indentured servitude type of system that locked them into place. Now, there are uh, workers in other in industri industries such as fisheries and certain manufacturing and heavy industries that uh, suffer even higher risks, sometimes even losing their lives. And these uh, problems are constantly pointed out by international society, and yet we are repeating the same kind of uh, mistakes and living with these problems still. Right, but hopefully we'll learn from our mistakes in the near future. Uh, keeping in mind what Professor Cho has just said, Zelana, this year Korea itself, mm -hmm. it's supposed to open its doors to 165,000 foreign mm -hmm. workers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That being said, speaking within your capacity, of course, mm -hmm. as a scholar, mm -hmm. what policies do you suppose need to be put in place to better protect these foreign mm -hmm. workers? So when we talk about foreign workers, now you are talking about foreign 3D workers and they will be employed in industries such as construction, manufacturing, fishery and even some service industries they become open from this, years, uh, from this year to uh, foreign workers. I first need to highlight why Korea needs this much workers and this is because all of these industries they they suffer from the lack of workforce. So they simply cannot function without the uh, foreign workforce. And uh, as Professor Cho just mentioned, so they will come to Korea through employee permit system, so-called EPS system, and this system allows them to stay maximum five years. They cannot extend, they cannot stay longer even if they want, and they can change employer three times within this system. And if they do that, they, each time they need to have signed written consent from previous employer. So if they were a little bit unlucky, if they have abusive employer, they, they need to suffer from this. And this is the main reason behind uh, violation of their rights. So this very small thing can be improved within EPS system. Another thing is, like I mentioned, many of them, they would like to extend their stay and stay uh, five plus years, but they cannot because Korean government wants to prevent their permanent settlement. Um, so they want to stay longer. Industries need them. What do they do? Uh, they become undocumented. They become illegal worker. And that is, that is the source of further exploitation. So I would suggest to deal with discrimination, all of these things, to prevent these things, uh, simply to allow them to stay a little bit longer or to at least consider this. And another issue is the issue of equal pay. Uh, as I mentioned, Equal Pay Act exists in Korea. However, obviously it is not enough. Uh, we see this because there is gender wage, page, uh, gender wage disparity in Korea, according to OECD, roughly 70% across industries and then with foreign workers they this affects them as well so if we want to uh, create com more competitive more fairer society uh, law is necessary but it will not be enough we all need to strive to deal with this kind of unfair uh, practices and to create definitely more fairer better society not only for immigrants but for Koreans as well Right then. Professor Joe, keeping in mind what uh, our Dr. Um, Zimir has just said then, what do you suggest perhaps, and I understand this might be a very difficult question, but what do you suggest to perhaps spur some tangible action to deal with these very clear problems that we have with regard to racism here in the country? <laughs> that is a very difficult question. It is. Question. It's a million dollar question. <laughs> but I know that from personal experience uh, and uh, from uh, you know eyewitness accounts, 
racism is not an inherent behavior. It's not something genetically built into us. Young children actually have no concept of race. They don't notice skin color. They don't notice uh, eye color. They don't. They obviously they notice that you know they look different, but they don't realize that that's a point of discrimination or that that's some a cause for prejudice or that they are different. It's a learned, socialized, uh, and a culturalized, uh, a culturalized behavior that is learned and taught by society. And so you only really see racist type of behavior. Uh, from children after a certain age. And so I think this is why it's really important that adults actually understand and become aware of their racist behavior. Very often we see a lot of Koreans engaging in racist behavior without even realizing that they're being racist. And I think that's because we haven't really had this kind of you know awareness campaign. So nowadays we know that uh, many older adults have become much more aware of gen gender equality and uh, acts uh, or words that can constitute, for example, um, sex discrimination in workplace and in other environments. And so in the same way, I think there, there should be widespread uh, education against race discrimination as well. Uh, in terms of tangible things, uh, one thing that we can definitely do uh, is to really spur on and enact the general anti-discrimination law, which has been languishing in the, the National Assembly for so many years. And things like uh, restoring the budget to uh, support the migrant worker uh, help centers around the, the nation, the annual budget for running those support centers was only something like 760, uh, sorry, 7.6 billion won, which is like less than 6 million dollars, less than one sixth of the overseas travel budget allocated for the first couple for this year. Uh, something like those uh, tangible acts can be done at, at a, as a minimum to, I think, try to combat racism in our society. Right, indeed. And staying with that, then, what more would you like to add to what mm -hmm. Professor Cho has said about dealing with racism here in the country? Well, I already provided some potential solution, and that is boosting multicultural education, fighting with false prejudice, allowing um, international people to speak with their own voice about problems they are facing. However, I haven't mentioned perhaps the most important thing, and that is nowadays all countries, all nations, all cities, they try to attract qualified international working force because they know that this is a source of competitiveness in front of the new AI revolution. So they provide favorable immigration policies, scholarships, funding. Uh, so Korea has been trying to do the same. However, there have been limitations. And how do I know this limitation is because among total immigrant population in Korea, 4% are foreign professionals and comparatively 8% are foreign students. So you see there is a reason why foreign students don't want to stay here longer or why foreign professionals don't want to settle here permanently. And racism, discrimination are one of the reasons. Coping with this issue is absolutely one million dollar question like you mentioned. It's, it, it, it will be really challenging. However, at Hanyang University, we already work on this. We try to find adequate solutions. But as a scholars, uh, our scholarly works will not be enough. We definitely need support from wider society. Uh, and uh, I would just like to emphasize that it is our own responsibility really to try to build up more competitive and more inclusive society for the benefit of all. If we manage to do that, I think Korea will become truly multicultural, not only in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality as well. All right, quality as you mentioned earlier. All right, Zelana, Dr. Zimmer, thank you so much for thank your you so time much. and your insights. <laughs> and Professor Chu, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Right, well, on that note, we end this week's editions of Issues and Insiders. Have a great weekend. See you same time next Monday.